You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cresta in the Afternoon. I'm Marcus Peter. Anyone who's been Catholic for a short amount of time hears the word philosophy in relation to the faith, as sometimes always synonymous with the work of theology. Philosophy is the reflective attempt to illuminate our human experience and integrate it into a unified, cohesive vision of reality. Catholic philosophy comes in many forms and borrows from many schools of thought, but it cannot deconstruct the ultimate truths of the faith. In fact, if anything, all the findings of philosophy bolster what we know about the faith. We explore the thoughts of four prominent Catholic philosophers with Dr. Richard Spinello. Dr. Richard Spinello is the author of Four Catholic Philosophers, Rejoining in the Truth, published by En Route Media. He is Professor of Management Practice at Boston College, where he teaches courses on ethics and applied ethics, and is also a member of the adjunct faculty at St. John Seminary in Boston. Find his writings in Crisis, The Catholic Thing, Homiletic and Pastoral Review, and other journals. He has written 15 books, including four on the work, the works of St. John Paul II. Richard, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, the joy is completely ours. I, I read your book with uh, much delight. I, I've got a deep love for the writings of these four philosophers as well. Uh, but I want to uh, take a step back here because we want to be careful into uh, not diving into a kind of esoteric conversation. If anything, there really is there really are findings in the works of all these four people that that lend credence to how we understand the faith. So I want to start by asking you first of all your own background and what prompted you to write this book. Yeah, well, thank you again. Um, well, my <clears throat> my background is uh, uh, obviously philosophy. I had the great opportunity to study philosophy at Fordham University with uh, some great Jesuits who um, turned me into a, a Thomist. Um, I had gone down there to uh, study Hegel, but uh, uh, they kind of convinced me that Aquinas was the way to go. So I left, uh, thanks to them, a, um, a true uh, Thomist. Um, and most of my work in the academy has involved ethics. Um, and somewhere along the way, thanks to my wife, I uh, began to explore the writings of uh, uh, St. John Paul II. Mm -hmm. um, I was teaching ethics for a long time, and she kept telling me, well, you've got to read Veritatis Splenda, this great encyclical that he had written in 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, and I put it off and said, yeah, okay, okay, you know. But finally, when I read it, it was a very eye-opening experience for me. It's an extraordinary encyclical, and it, it kind of reminds me of the the old story people used to tell about Goethe, uh, who said that the first time he read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, it was like walking into a brilliantly lighted room. Everything became clear to him. Now, no one else has had that experience yeah. of Kant, I'm sure. <laughs> but, uh, but for me... I'm surprised reading, to hear that. <laughs> right. Reading Veritatis Splenda was that, that was the experience. Uh, everything or many things became clear to me uh, about philosophy, about theology, about moral theology. So um, I decided I would dedicate a lot of my scholarly work to uh, John Paul II. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I've done, um, spending some time reading his philosophical works um, and uh, also his encyclicals. Uh, Fortunately, we have new translations of his philosophical work, so they're a little bit easier to get a hold of now, and a little bit easier to understand. And this book is sort of a, uh, a broadening of that effort, you know, looking at Wojtyla, but also looking at these other philosophers as well. Right. And, uh, you know, what's amazing about all of that is uh, John Paul II wasn't just a master philosopher, although that he was, uh, this wonderful philosopher-poet, uh, theologian, scripture scholar, there was not an area he didn't excel in. But uh, in, in your tying together these four philosophers, Jacques Maritain, uh, Edith Stein, Dietrich von Hildebrand, and then at the end, John Paul II, you, you really see that he was a master synthesizer as well. Because John Paul borrowed from the works of these three other philosophers amongst many other people. So th there's this kind of tying together of a system of thought that flourishes in John Paul's own writings. So tell us about that. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. I think he, uh, the, the main synthesis I think that he accomplishes is, is between 
the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, because he too is a Thomist. Mm -hmm. I think he's firmly committed to Aquinas' philosophy, Aquinas' metaphysics. Right. But he is able to fuse that with phenomenology mm -hmm. uh, in a, um, a very adept and clever way. So um, <clears throat> what he basically wanted to do was to say, okay, uh, Thomas Aquinas gives us kind of the foundation uh, this is the, uh, if we want to study, for example, anthropology, he gives us the foundation, the whole notion that the person is a substance and a natural unity uh, of body and soul. But one of the things that he um, lamented about Aquinas is that he didn't take the study of the human person further. And perhaps, you know, given the context in the 13th century, that that's, uh, you know, would have been uh, probably quite uh, almost impossible for mm -hmm. Aquinas. But using the method of phenomenology, what John Paul II uh, tried to do was to sort of explore the subjective life of the person. Right. You know, what's it like? Uh, it's not enough to say, well, the person's a substance, a natural unity of body and soul. What's, what's it like to be free? What's, it, uh, what's the experience of love? Um, sort of the subjective inner life of the person right. so that uh, we understand the person much more deeply. And for that, he uses the method of phenomenology. Right. So in his, his master work, uh, Person and Act, uh, that's essentially what he tries to do. Uh, Aquinas becomes the base, it's the foundation, and then using phenomenology, he goes off and explores the nature of the person in much more depth and in much more detail. Right. Now, he's inspired by Edith Stein, who predates him in this effort of trying to attempt a kind of phenomenology, but it's really the the non-Catholic, non-Christian philosopher Max Scheller's phenomenology that greatly inspires John Paul II's method. So what John Paul II does in wedding phenomenology with this Aristotelian Thomistic framework that was greatly flourished by Maritain and uh, von Hildebrand, uh, it's it's frankly unique and that's what makes it so brilliant so help, just help us understand that a little deeper um yeah i think i think that's right i think it is i think it is unique i mean i i think edith stein also as you say attempted the same thing sort of fusing together a thomas aquinas and phenomenology um <clears throat> and that she does in, in a book called finite and eternal being which i talk a little bit about mm -hmm. uh, in my book i don't go into it in great depth because it's an extremely difficult work um, and uh, so she sort of uh, is, is the precursor of John Paul II, and uh, perhaps uh, he, we don't really know to what extent, but we know, he, we know he, he admired her immensely, and he read her stuff. Um, he doesn't, we don't find in his books a lot of references to Edith Stein, so we don't know if he, to what extent he explicitly drew from her. Um, but but um, his attempt, I think, um, is a lot more fruitful than, than Edith Stein's. I think right. Edith Stein was just getting into St. Thomas Aquinas um, when she wrote this book, so she was still brilliant as she was, uh, somewhat of a beginner with Thomism. She certainly had mastered phenomenology, right. but she was still learning Aquinas, and I think her philosophy really would have evolved. Uh, had she lived, had she not been put to death in the camps as she uh, tragically was. But John Paul II, I think, didn't have that particular problem. So his his philosophy is unique because, again, it, it's just a, uh, um, a, a wedding together of metaphysics. Uh, There's a metaphysical anthropology with a phenomenology of the person, a look at the person's subjective life. Uh, a look, uh, an in-depth look at freedom, you know, freedom right. as connected to the truth, right? You really can't be free un unless you choose the truth. I mean, if you're diverted from the truth and you, because you're overwhelmed by the passions, you, you choose false goods, yep. you're really not free. So I, I think his uh, philosophy of freedom um, is very special. I, I don't... Uh, I think few philosophers can really match what he has done in that area. And the same would be true about his philosophy of love and responsibility. Mm -hmm. So in that another great masterwork, uh, he really provides for us uh, a unique vision of love that I think um, would speak to anybody. It's a difficult book, but I think um, if anybody really wants to understand what love is and get away from all the simple slogans, you know, love is love and all those things, really understand it, <laughs> this, 
this is the book. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so uh, he he um, um, he is really, I think, a very powerful thinker and one who speaks to the contemporary mind. Right. Uh, now, I'd like to uh, pivot a little to go back to the beginning of the book. Uh, we, we can open the conversation on Jacques and Raisa Marichan. Uh, largely, what were some of the the things that they were dealing with in terms of societal currents and intellectual problems, intellectual ideologies that were arising, especially uh, in the experience at the Sorbonne? Yeah, I think um, I do open the book that way. I uh, because their story is so compelling, right? Mm-hmm. So these are two people who uh, are so depressed at their university studies that they're contemplating suicide. Yeah. So people may think, well, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough at the university today, and of course it is really tough. But uh, um, it, it was tough then too. So. Um, <laughs> and the reason wasn't because of the workload, though. Right. It wasn't because of the workload. It wasn't because <laughs> they had too much to do. It was because they were just so disillusioned with the mm-hmm. content. Yeah. Uh, they were running into these uh, intellectual trends of positivism, historicism, uh, empiricism, scientism, you know, the idea that science is all there is, right. that there's nothing beyond the empirical world, that there's no spiritual reality. You know, no one ever talked about the soul. No one ever talked about God. No one ever talked about the eternal or universal values, or really ethics in, in its purest sense. So it left them very despondent, because they said, well, this, this, is this all there is, this material world? Mm-hmm. Uh, there has to be something more. Um, but they weren't going to find that at the Sorbonne. Yeah. And that's why uh, they, in this um, story that I tell, that I, I think perhaps other people would know it too, certainly, uh, when they're walking through the uh, this garden in the city of Paris, they talk about suicide uh, because, again, they're so despondent over what they see at the Sorbonne, over these intellectual trends. Right. Uh, and I should point out that they're, those intellectual trends are not that different from the ones we see today in the mm-hmm. university. Those, those trends are very much alive in most universities, which don't talk about spiritual reality. They don't talk about God. They don't talk about the absolute. That's true. Um, Richard, we're going to have to pause there. We've hit a hard break. We're continuing the conversation with Richard Spinello, author of Four Catholic Philosophers, Rejoining in the Truth, and we're talking about Jacques Maritain and Raisa Maritain right now. I'm Marcus Peter for Cresta in the Afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Cresta in the Afternoon. My guest, Richard Spinello author of Four Catholic Philosophers Rejoining in the Truth. We are talking about this, his recent book, Four Catholic Philosophers, published by En Route Media. And, Rich, we were talking earlier about Jacques Maritain and Raisa Maritain, and the the nihilism that they had come to ascribe to their own sense of existence, because they saw, in, in frankly, both of them being very intellectual, rational people, they saw that this was the natural end, that if the empiricist naturalist worldview was all there was to it, then Nietzsche was right. Right. I, yeah, I think that's right. And that's a very depressing, yeah, that's a very depressing conclusion. Right. You know, that, uh, because that, that is, uh, Nietzsche himself, of course, was an atheist uh, who, who um, saw nothing beyond this, this world, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so to come to that conclusion would be... Uh, you know, kind of disastrous, and that, that's what they thought. You know, I think as Risa said, I, 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 I could live in a world that's difficult, but not one that's absurd, where, there, where there's just no meaning to it. So they describe, but they, the point is about them is that they don't give up, uh, even though they um, experience this great despair and express it in this uh, walk they took through the garden. They uh, continue to search for the truth and for the absolute. They call themselves pilgrims of the absolute, which is a great phrase. And they're introduced to it by this very strange figure, Leon Bloy, uh, who's a novelist. They read one of his novels, and they're very much taken with this man. Mm-hmm. And he introduces them to Catholicism, to Christianity, uh, and they find the truth. You know, they, they uh, find the absolute, they find God, and they find meaning in their lives. Um, and um, they... Uh, pursue that truth through faith and reason, you know, yeah. so they continue to sort of unfold it and to think about it 
and to come to understand it, particularly Jacques Maritain, through the work of faith and reason, each kind of reinforcing the other. So it's quite a story, I think. It uh, has great relevance for today because a lot of people have doubts. A lot of people, you know, may succumb, even if they don't know it, to the trend of positivism, which kind of declares that, you know, the natural sciences are the only authentic yep. source of knowledge. Yep. So a lot of people struggle with these things. Um, and the example, I think, of Jacques and Marie Samaritan is a very good one for people to follow. I mean, we're all pilgrims of the absolute. That, that's, for, that's the absolute truth. Um, and um, I think, there, you know, there are no, no better couple to follow than Jacques and Raisa uh, to find the real absolute. Right. And you've got this, this other problem they're grappling with that you don't quite highlight in this book, but I understand for a fact that it's implicit in what you're writing about even here, which is that in the, in the naturalist empiricist perspective, it is inevitable that, like you mentioned, the, the positivistic worldview, uh, it is inevitable that you desire, that the human soul desires a kind of ontology. So the positivist then goes on to create an ontology by saying, well, the empirical world is all that matters, and it creates an ontological worldview based on that, even though the empirical worldview cannot allow for an, an, an ontological worldview. So comment on that dichotomy. Yeah, I think well, I think that's quite correct. I, uh, I think there is an implicit ontology there. Um, I, I think um, what we need to do, and I think this is what Jacques Maritain uh, understood pretty quickly after becoming a Catholic, is to get back to the real ontology, to get back mm -hmm. to the true metaphysics, which I think is the metaphysics of Thomas Aquinas. Right. Um, to begin to uh, think uh, about, to get, to get beyond the physical, to begin to think about the spiritual, spiritual realities like the soul. I mean, above all, metaphysics, real metaphysics now, not the, not the, uh, the uh, kind of ontology, as you say, of the empiricist, but real metaphysics gives us a vision of the whole, yep. you know, what's common to all real beings, which is being itself, and that's what all beings have in common. Um, and uh, to understand the inner harmony of the universe. God is the, the pure, infinite act of existence, the source of all being, the summon of all being, uh, who basically holds that universe together. So, um, Maritain understood pretty quickly that uh, metaphysics is key to be, be coming to a deeper understanding of <clears throat> the absolute, a deeper understanding of reality, uh, metaphysics, I think, gives roots to philosophical inquiry, and um, we need to get back to thinking about metaphysics, and particularly the metaphysics of St. Thomas Aquinas. Right. Uh, very much neglected today uh, at many Catholic universities. Uh, some, I think, are, are, you know, will teach Aquinas' metaphysics, but we, it, 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 it should be taught much more widely, I think. Mm -hmm. And between you and me, I firmly believe that we ought to begin teaching that framework from the high school level because even Aquinas during his time uh, presupposed that the, that some of those ideas were basics that were embraced by those who had some immersion in the liberal arts. And then once that was mastered, one could do the higher level thinking. Right. Yeah, that would not be a bad idea at all. Yeah, to, to, to begin at uh, sort of the lower level, to begin in high school, Catholic high schools particularly, because uh, uh, I think high school students could could come to an understanding if it's taught correctly yep. uh, of the basics of Aquinas's metaphysics. Yep, I completely agree. So this metaphysical framework that he gains by this kind of reclamation of the Aristotelian Thomistic uh, worldview prompts two of his great masterpieces. And he he wrote a lot of others, but uh, in particular, I'm thinking of the degrees of knowledge, his great epistemological masterpiece, and also his uh, great masterpiece piece on philosophical anthropology, uh, Integral Humanism. So just shed some light on the writing process behind that, his thought process behind them. Right, yeah, two, two of his, uh, uh, a lot of his books are, are very well known. I think um, those two probably stand out in some way. So mm -hmm. the, the, the degrees of knowledge is probably his masterpiece. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time writing about it in my book, because my book is really written for a general audience, so it, it's just designed to give sort of a people a taste of Mar Maritain's thought 
Right. Um, so I spend a little bit of time talking about degrees of knowledge, uh, which is his uh, effort to um, develop a critical realism. I mean, uh, uh, and that refutes subjectivism. That refutes the idea that truth is subjective in some way, uh, or the idea that we really can't know reality. The Kantian notion that uh, you know I can't really know the thing in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the table. I only know you know that's in front of me. I'm looking at a table in front of me. I don't know the table itself. I just know my idea of the table. Uh, he he wants to thoroughly refute that idea, yeah. uh, and to talk about knowledge as really a union of the knower and the known. You know, um, yes. and we, what we know we know through concepts which he calls or which he speaks about in terms of, uh, he calls them cognitional signs that are abstracted from reality. So we have these real beings around us and we're able to abstract concepts. You know, when I see many dogs, I'm able to abstract the concept of dog so I can identify any different dog as a dog. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's a very Thomistic approach to epistemology. Uh, and then there are, uh, he goes on to talk about these degrees of knowledge. So this is conceptual knowledge, mm -hmm. the one we're most familiar with. But then there's uh, the knowledge that comes with uh, the co-natural knowledge of the artist and the moral agent and the experiential knowledge of the mystic. So those are kind of the degrees of knowledge that he talks about. Um, Integral humanism is, is sort of an attempt to say, you know, to ask the question whether we can restore Christendom, restore a Christian society. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, you know, that probably isn't going to happen. <laughs> Not, we're never going to go back to the Middle Ages. But maybe we can um, uh, achieve a kind of compromise where Christian principles become the basis for laws, become the basis for society's uh, regulations of itself. Um, so that's essentially what integral humanism, I think, attempts attempts to do to sort of uh, grapple with that particular question about uh, to what extent um, can there be a return to, to Christendom? You know, so yeah. um, it's it's also, I think, a brilliant work and also quite quite relevant for today. So that dialogue, especially on that degree of knowledge that is known as the experiential knowledge, although. Uh, in in Maritain's framework that has to do with especially what the mystics experience, uh, the fact of the matter is experiential experiential sensory knowledge. Uh, it forms the bedrock of the methodology that is phenomenology. And what Edith Stein attempts to do is to create, if you will, a system that doesn't really exist at that point. And she is quite the master phenomenologist. At this, long before she becomes Sister Teresa Benedicta, she she has a real mind for grappling with that system. So let's open the conversation there. Yeah, she she really does. I, I think um, if you if you look at her very first book, right, her uh, which was her dissertation uh, on empathy. Uh, this is a, a it's a difficult book, but again, a, a brilliant one. Um, so she does a phenomenology of empathy. Mm -hmm. um, talking of empathy means entering into the life experience of another person. Um, you know, I I can, for example, immerse myself in in my friend's grief mm -hmm. over her mother's death, uh, even though I don't feel um, that grief myself. I mean, I don't I don't directly experience it, but I can still immerse myself in in my friend's grief. Um, so that is empathy, and what she does with this is interesting because. Um, she says that empathy can really expand our experience because I can have empathetic awareness of something that I haven't personally experienced firsthand. You know, I can have yeah. empathetic awareness of being courageous in the face of danger. You know, the fireman. I'm not a fireman, but I can have an empathetic awareness of what that's like. I can learn about myself through the empathy of others, right? So others have empathy with me and they see uh, something in me, you know, maybe they. Uh, they, they realize I'm not as generous as I <clears throat> think I am. And through my empathetic awareness of their view of me, I, I, I can get a better understanding of myself. Um, so I can also become, through empathy of others, clear about my own personality and its deficiencies. So if I am encounter another person who has the virtue of patience, and I tend to be very impatient, uh, I, I get an understanding of what that means, of what patience is. Right. Uh, 
and its its virtue, you know, and my deficiency. So she takes this theme of empathy and uh, brings it in very different directions. We see that it's a a very powerful concept, a very powerful idea. All this is uh, <clears throat> Edith Stein, the phenomenologist. Yeah. Um, so she, it's a it's a brilliant piece. Unfortunately, it's she is very difficult. Uh, <laughs> She, the, the Maritan's fairly clear, so um, people who pick up Maritan, I think most of Maritan, the degrees of knowledge is pretty tough, but most of his books are pretty Rich, clear. Rich, we're going to take a break right here, uh, just to pause. We're talking to Rich Spinello, author of Four Catholic Philosophers Rejoining in the Truth. I'm Marcus Peter for Cresta in the Afternoon. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Cresta in the Afternoon. I'm Marcus Peter. My guest, Richard Spinello, author of Four Catholic Philosophers Rejoining in the Truth, published by En Route Media. So, Rich, we were talking earlier about Edith Stein, and she writes during a time of significant historical and political upheaval during the Third Reich. And so her work, Finite and Eternal Being, is a continuation of Maritain's own work, but there's a distinct reason why she sees the need to to engage that, especially pertaining to the the philosophies that are flying around society where she lives. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think um, uh, she probably saw it as uh, some kind of uh, uh, answer to what was going on in current society. Uh, it, I mean, it's it does a lot of things. It basically kind of lays out. Uh, a very sophisticated anthropology that uh, I think moves away from Aquinas in some directions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I think also, perhaps um, more significantly than Finite and Eternal Being, the, the book that really um, maybe also anticipates some of what was going on in current society uh, is uh, the book where she addresses the individual and community, mm -hmm. where she makes these very interesting distinctions between the different ways in which people socially interact, you know, the mass, uh, where there are no personal relationships, where people are just loosely united, where ideas spread like a contagion, uh, and, and the whole notion, notion of mass contagion is very similar to what happens in a totalitarian state. Uh, and she makes this further distinctions between the association and the community, and basically the emphasis on the necessity of real community, uh, uh, which is a, a community is a natural union. You know, the family is a community. It's something that's organic, something natural. Um, and uh, she spends a lot of time talking about the emphasis, uh, I'm sorry, talking about the, the necessity and benefits of community life because she realizes that um, life is not a lone adventure. Yep. It's not some solitary personal odyssey where the community plays only a peripheral role. Mm -hmm. But communities like the family, uh, the church, uh, political society are critically important. Uh, as I say in the book, for her to ask what kind of person should I become is also to ask what kinds of community should I belong to. And that's why she became herself, once she converted to Catholicism, she joins the Carmelite. She joins that community. She becomes a nun because that's the kind of person she wanted to be, this total dedication to God. So I think um, that book is an interesting uh, contrast to what was going on around her. Um, uh, so too is finite and eternal being, but I think this book, uh, Individual and Community, yeah. uh, is, a, is a lot more accessible uh, than finite and eternal being. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, especially with, with regard to how how much easier it is to apply the principles in in the book to uh, one's lived experience. Now, uh, from there, then I would, I'd like to pivot or take a step forward into someone one would consider as a contemporary, Dietrich von Hildebrand. Uh, Hildebrand was outspoken about the atrocities of the Third Reich, uh, giving lectures blatantly decrying the the sheer uh, evil that is racism and, and what the Third Reich was hoping to achieve. So as a philosopher, he was driven by a very strong, clear ethical system, that, and, and he, he was very public about it, too. Uh, yes, he was, yeah. I think... Um, 
all of these philosophers, uh, in their own way, really stand up against Nazism. Mm -hmm. They stand, uh, you know, National Socialism. They stand up against other totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union. They stand up against fascism. Uh, but I think it's particularly true of one of one Hildebrand. Yeah. Um, the it's and it's interesting to contrast. Uh, the way in which these philosophers react to these terrible regimes, to the way secular philosophers of the last century react. You know, we have uh, uh, Heidegger, who praises uh, National Socialism, talks mm -hmm. about the inner truth and greatness of National Socialism. Uh, <clears throat> the philosopher Alexander Kojev, who praised the universal homogenous state directed mm -hmm. by Stalin, uh, Foucault, who was in love with Mao and, yeah. uh, you know, the, the revolution, and Sartre was another big fan of the Soviet Union. Um, these are all, uh, in the words of Mark Lilla, who wrote a wonderful book about them called Reckless Minds. They're, they're reckless minds, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, but we don't find this kind of recklessness among Catholic philosophers. Catholic philosophers are, are very secure uh, and in their beliefs, and, and know that these regimes are terribly wrong, and they you're not going to you're not going to hear them talk about you know the inner truth and greatness of national socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to hear the opposite, which it comes from people like Dietrich von Hildebrand. So, and I think you know what's behind this this contrast between these reckless minds and the Catholic philosophical mind. Um, a lot of it has to do with the faith, you yes. know, because we see that without the guiding light of faith. Reason can easily become very erratic, mm -hmm. and, it, and it can even become violently irrational. And I think we, uh, I think that's um, definitely the case with uh, many of the secular philosophers of the last century. So I do spend uh, some time in the book making this contrast between uh, the secular philosophy of the 20th century and Catholic philosophy. Right. Um, and, and Rich, it's it's really true that uh, in my own work of. Re reading into how we wound up in modern relativism. Uh, there are a couple of favorite books I enjoy uh, looking at and going back to Revolt Against Reality being one of them by Gary Machuta, uh, but also Seat of Wisdom. And, and it's very clear that French Enlightenment thought tr uh, attempted, th this, this post-French revolutionary thought, uh, attempted this unfettered intellectual flight of fancy that was completely ungrounded in any of the epistemological or logical frameworks that preceded them and all that resulted in all that resulted in is a completely subjectivist relativistic framework that has no ground to stand on its own and shoots itself in the foot mm -hmm. yeah that's i think i think that's quite i think that's quite true uh i think again that's what happens when you leave uh the faith behind you, and when you abandon, you know, real metaphysical thinking, uh, when when you when you uh, um, move away from those deep roots, uh, you're going to end up in a in a sea of relativistic thinking, and I, I think that's exactly what's going on there. Now, the masterful work of von Hildebrand also transcends into the kind of work the Second Vatican Council was hoping uh, to do. Von Hildebrand was, was a, an external voice uh, into the work of the Second Vatican Council. And so to the fore, then, we, we introduced this great figure of who would eventually become John Paul II. But even prior to that, he was the brilliant, enlightened, insightful uh, Carol Wojtyla, Cardinal Carol Wojtyla, who was, as we mentioned earlier, the master philosopher. So, talk about how, as John Paul enters th this framework, what what does he have to contend with on a societal sphere? Um, well, John Paul II, I think, um, <clears throat> his story is also, I think, very dramatic. I mean, each of these stories is quite dramatic. Yeah. Uh, so, John Paul II, he is the only one of the four who is not a convert. So, he is a Catholic from birth born in the town of Wadowice in Poland and grew up in a, uh, even though his uh, his mother had died when he was very young, he, he grew up with a, a very faithful Catholic father uh, in a household that he described as his first seminary. Uh, the turning point for him, though, comes when he's in World War II. So all four of these people have to deal with World War II. Yep. Um, where in Poland, you know, if, uh, in World War II, you, uh, you just worried every day you'd be put to death. Uh, if you are someone like Wojtyla, um, he had wanted to become an actor. That was his great goal in life, uh, to, to go to the Jagiellonian University and be an actor. 
but he decides during World War II that the uh, you know and uh, he's going to be a priest. Um, so he, like Edith Stein, is very much open to the unexpected and open to the work of divine providence and willing to change his mind. Um, so he sets out on this journey to be a priest. Uh, he has to go into an underground seminary, which took immense courage. So we see in his life the, the same kind of courage we find in von Hildebrand, we find in Maritain, who stand up to uh, National Socialism. We see the same thing in, in Moitia. Um, and he, his intellectual background is interesting. His, he, after he gets ordained, he goes to study at the Angelicum. He writes his first thesis on St. John of the Cross. Mm-hmm. And then at the Jagiellonian, his second thesis is on Max Scheler. Right. So his work is a blend of Carmelite spirituality. He loves St. John of the Cross. It's a blend of phenomenology. Uh, and it's a blend of Thomism. So mm-hmm. there are many different influences that come into play there. Um, he, he uh, and, and again, that's what, as we said before, that's what makes his work, I think, quite unique. Right. Um, what he sought to do um, with, uh, there are two great master works of Carl Wittier. So one was The Person and Act, the second is Love and Responsibility. Mm-hmm. And I might point out that, uh, you know, just to, to pair him up with von Hildebrand, Two of the greatest books on love that probably have ever been written by philosophers are written by these two. Von mm-hmm. Hildebrand wrote The Essence of Love, and John, and John Paul II, when he was Carl with T.R. wrote Love and Responsibility. Right, right. If anybody wants to know what love is, these are the two <laughs> books that are different, but they complement each other, and they're both brilliant. Uh, and Love and Responsibility was an attempt to give some grounding, some foundational grounding to Humanae Vitae. He was very concerned about the way Humanae Vitae was rejected and ignored in the church. Yep. Uh, and uh, Love and Responsibility, along with his later book, Theology of the Body, is an attempt to sort of, uh, uh, as I say, give a foundation to it, um, obviously, because that's something you really can't do in an encyclical. Um, so that's, that, was his, that was his concern, uh, I think, coming out of the Council. Yeah. Not so much what was said at the Second Vatican Council, because they had sort of postponed the whole issue of contraception, and Paul VI addressed it directly in Emanuel Vitae. Uh, but he was concerned about it, uh, again, about its rejection, about uh, the fact that people didn't understand it, uh, that there wasn't enough of a theoretical background or philosophical background for people to understand the reasoning behind it. And um, that's what he tries to do with Love and Responsibility, to fill that gap. And many people take for granted, we only have two, uh, under two minutes left in the segment, but many people take for granted the sheer popular appeal that love and responsibility had amongst the young couples that he taught it to. The, the fact was he discovered that there was a real hunger amongst especially the young people he ministered to for hearing the perennial truths of the church expounded to them in the clear way that he was masterful at doing. Yes, I think that's right. I think it's the same thing today because I teach this book uh, and people love the book. It's not an easy book to read, but people really love the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, it speaks to the young person uh, of today. I think they realize that, there, that the truth is being spoken here. Um, and I think this is a book we need to get out there. I, I think it definitely appeals to young people because it, uh, it really offers the truth about love. Uh, because I think he's, this is something that he's really discovered. Uh, and as I say, it's so different from the simplistic slogans we hear today about love is love. Love is right. a complex reality. Uh, and he really kind of lays it out in a very uh, uh, lucid and coherent way. Right. And his his deep comprehension of person and act, of the nature of freedom and its uh, proper exercise, and his proper comprehension of what social justice ought to look like, paved the way for not only the fall of the Berlin Wall, but also the theology of the body that we received as a result. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true as well. Um, yes, I think that's absolutely correct. There's also his notion, uh, in person and act, of, 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 of genuine participation. You know, <clears throat> uh, like Edith Stein, he puts a lot of emphasis on the the need for community, but a, a real community uh, where people uh, contribute to the common good, but their freedom is maintained. You know, that's the key to community for him. It's not wiped away as it is in a totalitarian state. People are able to be free. Uh, in, in, in communal living through uh, this, uh, what, he, what he, he refers to this as participation, right. you know, our equality of the person. So 
uh, his ideas are definitely relevant. Um, they uh, speak to us today. He's, uh, I would say the same for all these philosophers, uh, for von Hildebrand, for Edith Stein, for Jacques Maritain, uh, and for uh, Carol Waitia. Uh, they, um, they have something to say to all of us. And my hope is that people will kind of rediscover some of these books and rediscover these thinkers and uh, pick up a book or two by one of these thinkers, and I think I think they'll be pleasantly surprised right. at uh, how relevant they are. Well, thank you so much for your time on the program today, Rich. I've been talking to Richard Spinello, author of Four Catholic Philosophers, Rejoining in the Truth, published by En Route Media. I'd greatly encourage you to procure a copy for yourself. It's an easy read, it's very accessible, and it's very enlightening to understand all of the philosophical frameworks that led to the papacy of John Paul II. I'm Marcus Peter for Cresta in the afternoon. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.